Hey, good evening, everyone. So my name is uh, Mehdi. So a quick introduction. Daytime, I, um, I work at uh, IBM. I'm a frame manager in the field of uh, high performance computing, uh, quantum computing, and uh, artificial intelligence. So lots of stuff going on these days. And uh, nighttime, um, as soon as I'm done with my uh, official job, I'm a happy RASC member. And uh, so my background in, um, in physics explains uh, why if you put a laptop or anything that has a keyboard in front of me, my fingers start moving uh, by themselves. <laughs> if you put an helium tank not too far from me, I'll start breathing it and talk and make kids laugh. That's the second thing. But um, what I absolutely love is uh, playing with data, either my own data that I require when I have time. And I'm officially the... Um, uh, the official blood bank for the Mosquito Nation north of uh, Toronto. So that's uh, another thing. I also do observation uh, winter time when it's like extremely cold because the, the sky is just absolutely beautiful. And uh, when I need some sleep or uh, I don't have enough coffee, then I take data from uh, either the big um, uh, telescopes that are operated all around the world, like the uh, European uh, Southern Observ Observatory, uh, Mauna Kea, uh, the um, uh, Hubble Space Telescope as well. I love the Hubble Space Telescope. So tonight, um, I'm going to talk about uh, publicly available data. That's the one from the uh, New Horizons uh, mission about the uh, solar system, Pluto, um, Charon, and the Kuiper Belt. So you can see on the, on the left, that's a mosaic of uh, Pluto made from the, uh, the data from uh, the New Horizons spacecraft. In the middle, I it's uh, Charon, and on the right, it's... Uh, a screenshot uh, when I was doing some measurement to calculate the diameter of, uh, of Pluto. So solar system, let's start from scratch. So when I hear those two words, solar system, the what comes in my mind is a picture. It almost exactly this one, except, okay, the sizes are at scale, obviously not the distances, but uh, that's what comes in my mind, planets, basically, and planets that I can see, naked eyes, planet that planets that I can see with my telescope, and stuff that I really would like to see, but I can't. And actually, that's a very small part of the solar system. I did, um, or oh one thing I, I forgot to mention, I, I also run the um, astronomy and science club at my son's school, because I, I love doing stuff, but I also love teaching stuff to the, to the kids. And uh, I did a presentation on the solar system, and uh, one question that uh, came in my mind was, OK, wait a minute, we're talking about solar system, but..." What is it exactly? What's the boundary of the solar system? Where does it end? And when um, basically real space uh, starts? And that's actually a very good question. So as usual, when I ask myself questions like that, I spent half of the night on Wikipedia. So w when we go back home, I invite you to look, look up. So where does the solar system end? And actually, that's extremely, inter extremely interesting because when one thing stops and another one starts at, at the boundary, it's basically um, physics processes that stops, and that's another one that, uh, that we start, and there's a transition and everything. So it's, uh, yeah, e extremely interesting, but not tonight. Um, so let's um, get the big picture of the solar system. So we'll see there's lots of donuts, so your um, uh, basically sugar level will uh, rise a bit uh, tonight. The first big donut uh, is the, um, the Oort cloud. I know it's difficult to pronounce. Uh, I it's basically this um, on the bottom left, this big uh, blue ring. And uh, it's, it's really big and it contains lots of stuff. Like we estimate up to a trillion of icy objects. So that's another word for comets basically. And sometimes one will just drift, uh, get closer to the sun and we will have a very good uh, show at night. The um, super small uh, red ellipsoid so that's the orbit of uh, Sedna, which is a trans-Neptunian object. It's not that big, 1,000 um, kilometers uh, uh, diameter. Uh, the funny thing is uh, I it takes uh, Sedna 11,000 years to uh, go around the sun. So if at some point it gets uh, close to you, that's not going to happen again in your lifetime. Um, the, um, if, if we zoom in, then uh, we'll see the orbit of Sedna and a bunch of uh, or orbits in different colors. So we can zoom again 
and uh, then we are in what's called the uh, outer uh, solar system. And you have the usual suspects like uh, Pluto, Saturn, uh, Neptune. And there's our second uh, donut made of those uh, blue, blue dots. That's the Kuiper belt. It's beyond the orbit of Neptune. Um, Pluto is the most massive object, most known, at least for now. And uh, it's similar to the uh, asteroid belt. I'm going to talk about the asteroid, uh, asteroid belt in uh, 30 seconds. Except that the objects are primarily made of ice. Like it, it's not as icy as comets, but still there's lots of uh, ice. And then we'll go uh, to our last uh, donut for, for, for tonight. In the uh, inner solar system, you clearly see that big ring of, um, uh, it's the asteroid belt. So the big difference uh, between the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt, so they are mainly rocky and metallic. It's between Mars and uh, Jupiter, and the largest asteroid is uh, Ceres. So that's, uh, th that gives you a nice uh, picture um, of the solar system, like going a bit beyond the planet. So I have uh, another question for you for tonight, again after those five hours on, on Wikipedia. Then why do we have these donuts, like those rings? Wh why rings? And basically, if you change scale, you have another ring. For anyone, uh, so uh, okay, I'll give you a hint. You go on YouTube and um, and check for stuff like uh, protoplanetary disk and uh, solar system formation, and you will see that basically when the cloud of gas just collapses on uh, on itself, then it uh, with the spin it will go basically thinner and, and thinner, and then you will get uh, uh, like when you do a, a sauce for like pasta or stuff like that, mixing milk and uh, and flour, you have those clumps in there and they will aggregate more and more matter and you will end up with what will be planets at the end of the day. And there's like very nice uh, simulations um, available on YouTube for that. So what can you see? So naked eyes, the moon, of course, and you can even see structures on, on the moon if you don't need uh, many glasses like uh, me. You can see some planets. I mean, Mars these days, is pff, the color is absolutely beautiful. Um, then uh, usually I, I do borrow my um, daughter's binoculars and then I can see craters on the moon. That's uh, awesome. I can play Galileo and watch the, the moons of Jupiter. I mean, moving around uh, night after night. night. That's pretty nice. But I if I want to see like, like real structures and, and, and stuff, basically I, I use my uh, telescope and that's why I mentioned about uh, cold, cold nights. Well, actually, it's day, but it's uh, even colder at night. So that's what you can see in terms of uh, planets with a uh, small scope, like it's uh, Celestron 8, so very small. So from uh, left, bottom, Venus, Uranus, of course, Jupi I, I'm a big fan of Jupiter, by the way. And uh, you can see the great red spot and, um, and a moon and the shadow of the moon on the, on the atmosphere of the planet. Mars, when there was no dust storm, you can clearly see some, uh, so it, it's not crisp, but, but you can clearly see some structures. And then, of course, um, Venus. I'm a big fan of, uh, of Venus as well. So that's what you see with a scope, but no Pluto. Oh, of course, don't forget the moon. So I was not a big fan of the moon until uh, two, three years ago, because you can get like awesome shots of the moon with a small scope like this one, the Clavius crater. So yeah, same one as the one in the movie. And um, so it th there's a technique, like a uh, uh, technique to take like pic planetary pictures. Usually you don't take pictures, but you take movies and then you use a software to select the best frames and you, you stack them and then you do a post-processing. So what I'm going to talk about after is not, not movie at all. It's like pictures, like uh, selfies. So you can also do science. And uh, as I mentioned, my background is in, uh, is in physics, and I love especially measuring stuff. And when I can, when I can measure something, I'm happy. So this happened like a few years ago. Um, I was out in my backyard, and pff, I was doing like random stuff. And I thought, OK, wait a minute. Ah, seeing is uh, pretty good tonight. It was not supposed to be uh, that good. So let's uh, take some uh, pictures, so movies, actually, of uh, Jupiter. And uh, what I wanted to, to do or originally was take like multiple pictures and then do some kind of uh, short animation to show the transit of the great red spot on, uh, on Jupiter. And then I thought, uh, I should be able to measure the size of the great red spot. And then same as for the uh, solar system, 
my next question was, uh, wait a minute, where does that stuff end? Basically, what's the boundary of the, uh, the end of the Great Red Spot? And that was the most difficult part of my, uh, of my work, finding out the um, uh, boundary of the Great Red Spot. So you see for each uh, picture, so there's a crop of the GRS, and then I did some uh, magic with my software to expose the boundaries in uh, black and white. So in some pictures, it's like perfect, clear. Some of them are like super noisy. So I, um, I used some uh, uh, standard statistics mathematics and uh, basically an average of everything. Uh, so I did the average for the certain images I, I knew because I, I measured my, um, uh, basically the uh, optical properties of my system. So I was able to get the scale and everything. And uh, my final values were uh, 16,587 kilometers for the uh, equatorial diameter and 10,020 kilometers for the polar diameter. Then I compared that, I did a search on one of my best friends, uh, Google, and uh, I found uh, a paper published by NASA. They did uh, the same type of measurement using uh, some pictures from the uh, Hubble Space Telescope in 2014. And they ended up with uh, an equatorial diameter of 16,500 kilometers. So that, that was pretty good and pretty accurate. So yes, you can do real science from uh, your backyard. And it's not even using like uh, uh, super difficult uh, mathematics. OK, so looks cool. But um, let's say you don't have a telescope. Um, it's too cold, too cloudy. Tell me about it. Like it, most of the time, it's just too cloudy. Um, or, oh. Damn, I fell asleep before my preferred planet <laughs> shot up uh, in the sky. Or I want to see more details, or I want to see Pluto, for example. So I didn't include my shot of Pluto because that's completely boring. It's a dot within many dots. So, and that would be quite interesting to see details of Pluto. So what can you do? So you can try to uh, win lottery many, many times and then sponsor your own space mission to Pluto. <laughs> Or you can wait for someone to send something there. And, uh, and, and these days, what's what I find ac actually completely amazing, every single space mission, basically whatever comes back to Earth is made publicly available. So there are two types of people. The ones who make stuff available now, when it uh, comes back to uh, Earth, and the ones who have uh, a data embargo for usually four to six months. So that happened for the Rosetta mission and the uh, 67P uh, comet. And nobody was happy about that, and I hope that's not going to happen uh, ever again. But um, you can get access to uh, almost instant uh, data. So that, that's what I call um, raw data. There is no, no correction of any kind, so it's not a reduced uh, set of data. But you can still do lots of cool stuff with it. And that's, uh, that's an example. On the left, it's the um, uh, comet uh, 67P. Oh, and actually, comet is written in French without the accent. But uh, and the picture was taken by the the, the Rosetta spacecraft, and uh, there's like thousands of uh, pictures and actually awesome pictures. You can get to a level of details. I mean, it's sub uh, sub meter uh, details on the on the surface. You can build uh, mosaics. You can build animations, and you can see the comet like uh, turning around. So that, that's lots of fun and of course, lots of time. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope is absolutely great for, for Jupiter. So that's uh, an image I, I made of um, HST data that, um, that was taken in uh, July 1994 when the uh, Schumacher-Levy 9 comet uh, just crashed. Actually, some fragments crashed onto Jupiter. So you can see the two impacts here, those black things, and you can see the shock wave actually in the uh, atmosphere. So that's interesting. I was not able to find um, enough images to, um, to actually calculate the speed of the, the, the shock wave, but you can still calculate lots of things. Um, so yes, all the data is uh, publicly available, but th there's one, one, one thing. First, you need to know where to find it, and uh, you need to know how to process it. And it's, it's very different from uh, one mission to another one. So usually what happens is on the website uh, of the, um, the mission itself, they will publish raw data as soon as they come back to, uh, to Earth. And, uh, and then on the PDS, Planetary Data System uh, website, then you will have access to, uh, to 
the entire data set, the non-corrected one and the reduced uh, data set. And sometimes the difference between uh, what you can do with raw stuff versus um, reduced data set is quite, uh, quite impressive. So just to give you a few examples, um, I took like few hundreds of uh, pictures from the um, Mars rover. Basically, it, it, it has uh, a camera under him, and uh, it took pictures during the, the descent. So it's super easy to go on the website, grab like a few thousand pictures, select the, the one that you want to use, and you can make a movie of the rover basically landing on Mars. And it's funny because you, uh, Anna, you, you can check, uh, I put it on, uh, on YouTube, you can see the ejection of the uh, heat shield at the beginning. And then, so it, it falls like this, and then you have the, the parachute that opens and it starts like moving like this. And then finally, it, it, uh, just before it touches the, the ground, basically you have the, the rockets that start to, uh, to make sure the landing is uh, smooth. So that's, again, lots of fun. So that's for, for Mars. Um, and the uh, reduced data set is uh, way better than the uh, raw data set for one main thing because it's uh, basically color uh, corrected. So the colors are, are way better on the uh, reduced data set. So that's for Mars. Um, Cassini, they, they did put uh, data online as soon as they came back to Earth. The uh, New Horizons data, same. Uh, the down mission, same. Like basically, these days, they all do that, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool for, actually for kids, because the rover, so Mars is not that far, so it doesn't take long to, uh, for the data to, uh, to come back to Earth, and you can see almost what's going on that instant. So that's uh, every day you can check and you will get new pictures. So that's pretty cool. So my preferred spacecraft. So first I'll start, I'll start with the Voyager missions because that's when I was kids. I mean, that was for me um, lifetime events. The, the first detailed pictures of Jupiter, Uranus and, and Neptune, that was just completely amazing. Like the great red spot, like big, unbelievable. Um, then I would say Galileo despite its uh, uh, problem with its uh, high gain antenna. So not all the data was uh, transmitted back to Earth, but the pictures are beautiful. And so when I say data is uh, publicly available, well, I'm not talking about the, the pictures as well. So the probe that the Galileo spacecraft sent to the um, atmosphere of, of Jupiter did uh, transmit back uh, measurements of the pressure uh, on uh, to uh, to Galileo, and there's a file, a text file available on PDS that shows the, the increasing um, uh, pressure. And of course, at some point, the the, the sensor just blew up. But uh, it's a uh, funny thing. Uh, Cassini, I did follow Cassini for pff, more than five years, and I think I I watched the end of Cassini like live when it basically. Uh, got destroyed in the uh, atmosphere of uh, Saturn. I think I, I cried, which is not, I mean, five years. I mean, for, for and one thing that you need to realize, we will see that uh, later on, but for the scientists working on, on this type of project, that's their life. Basically, so many years to uh, come up with the idea, do all the validation, build a spacecraft, send it, and then get the data back, do all the analysis. Yeah, that's one, one life. Then MR1, the uh, high-rise camera, beautiful pictures, New Horizons Pluto, down Ceres, and uh, Juno is awesome. Like my, uh, my son and all the kids at the Astro Club, we did play with the Juno Cam uh, raw data. And uh, the very nice thing is this camera was um, part of the scientific payload, but it's really like a citizen science camera. The, the goal is uh, for people to play with data, and once you, uh, once you, um, you do the, the post-processing yourself, you upload your, your image and uh, you're published on the NASA website. So all the kids got super excited about that. So one picture worth a thousand words. Let's see what happens when you add time to it. And uh, let's watch a trailer for a movie that's been already released. There's a mysterious zone far out in our solar system. It's a region of ice worlds, some solitary, some with moons. Their names may be unfamiliar. Eris, Makemake, Haumea, but they hold clues to all our origins. And the first of these worlds, and the one we'll reach in 2015, is the king of the Kuiper Belt, Pluto. 
The long journey of NASA's New Horizons mission began in 2006 aboard America's biggest, baddest rocket, tricked out with every conceivable booster. We built a very light spacecraft and bought a very large launch vehicle, and the combination is ferocious. But in some sense, it all began in 1930 with Clyde Tombaugh, 24 years old and fresh off a farm in Kansas, but willing to spend long hours scanning star fields to find a moving point of light, humanity's first glimpse of Pluto. The dream of actually getting to Pluto began with a six-year-old boy in love with science who grew up to lead a team of brilliant researchers and engineers with dogged persistence through decades of planning and building and testing. A race against time just to get to the launch pad. Exploring the outer solar system, because it's so far, takes a lot of time. It requires a lot of patience, a lot of dedication, a lot of perseverance, but it's the frontier. Assuming all goes well at Pluto, NASA may choose to extend the adventure further out into the Kuiper Belt, the solar system's mysterious third zone. This is maybe the one chance in my lifetime that we're going to get a spacecraft out there and look up close at one of these Kuiper Belt objects. December 6, 2014. We have long to wake up with spacecraft. New Horizons wakes up for the last time from hibernation. New Horizons is speeding towards Pluto at a phenomenal rate, and we can't wait for it to get there. January 27, 2015. Six months of approach science begins. July 14, 2015. New Horizons' long journey, three billion miles nine years in flight, and 85 years of speculation about Pluto, climaxes in one day of close approach and flyby. You know, we're rounding third base and we're headed home. The dream, the adventure, the promise of discovery. That's what makes 2015 the year of Pluto. So everything went well. And uh, Actually, there are a few um, fun facts. So that's what you get um, on the um, New Horizons website when you look for raw data. <laughs> and that I was just clicking, trying to refresh my browser like every, uh, every five seconds to see when the uh, data will uh, show up, monitoring Twitter and everything. And as soon as they were available, then I, I started to, uh, to dive in the data, try to find, um, actually the interesting thing is, uh, so when it's, Far enough, you get almost the full view of the, the planetary disk, and when it gets closer and closer, then uh, you get only uh, uh, only pieces. So you need to find. Okay, uh, I do believe that those ten pieces will allow me to make um, uh, basically a full um, full planet uh, full planet view. And so sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're you're, you're not. The uh, other thing is, uh, so who knows how fast a Boeing 747 goes? Any idea in terms of uh, kilometers per hour? How fast goes a 747? Yes, so it's between 8 and, and, and 900. So the um, New Horizon spacecraft, any ideas uh, about the its uh, speed? Almost there, 58, so f around 58,000 kilometers per hour. So that, that was really a, a, a paparazzi story. That stuff just came super fast, close to uh, Pluto, bang, 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 lots of, uh, lots of shots, and actually it took like months to, uh, to get the data back, uh, back to Earth because it's uh, super far. So that, that was uh, quite incredible. And it, when it's um, that far, obviously any error that you make in terms of navigation or anything like that, then well, that's, that's too bad. So that's what you um, that's what you get uh, when the dat data is uh, released, and uh, you can do some um, homemade uh, processing, and uh, that's what I did with the uh, raw data. So on the left it's uh, it's Pluto, and on the right it's um, uh, Charon. So that's uh, basically it, it's just mosaics. Now the thing is, it all depends on what type of software that you use for the mosaic. If you use like the standard um, astronomy things like, uh, I don't know, PixInsight, for example, that's gonna take a long, long time and probably you won't be successful. So I used one thing that's called um, uh, 
auto panel, and I have a slide um, for it uh, later on. The um, ah, I'll tell you the fun fact about auto panel when I'll uh, reach the slide. But first, uh, let me introduce you to my uh, friends. So Laurie, Alice, Ralph, Rex, uh, Pepsi, and uh, Swap. So that's basically the uh, scientific payload for New Horizons. The one that um, I'm going to use is this one, LORI, the Long Range uh, Reconnaissance Imager. So it's a um, telescope that's uh, yeah, 208 uh, centimeters, so a small one, but it's um, a special one, not like the one I have in my backyard. And it's special because if you have a telescope on a spacecraft, then obviously you need to have something outside and something else inside. So the challenge here for, for Pluto was, uh, well, outside is super cold. And when I say super cold, we're talking about like minus 200 uh, Celsius. And inside, it's typically between 0 and 40 Celsius. So you need to have um, to build something with these tubes that will resist this range of temperature, and there will be no obvious dilation or, or stuff like that. So the, the focal length, for example, won't won't change, and you will be able to uh, to have uh, clear pictures. That's a very interesting uh, mechanical engineering uh, challenge, but NASA did it, and uh, it went uh, pretty well. So that's a nice picture of the uh, of the scope. So the second thing I need to know about my friend Lori is um, the uh, optical specifications. So there's one way to do it, and actually it works for Lori, it works for the uh, Hubble Space Telescope if you want to know oh, what's the uh, central wavelength of this filter that I uh, uh, got on my um, latest uh, HST download or any other uh, spacecraft. So to get the uh, to the optical properties so you have all the values that you need and equations that you need to calculate stuff again. So you need to dig a bit and find out uh, the uh, technical uh, paper that was published and there's always a technical paper uh, published with all the characteristics of all the equipment. And in this case, uh, long story short, you can see some information here. So it's a uh, narrow angle field of view, high resolution. It's a rich uh telescope. And that's the size of the primary um, mirror. They give the focal length. Um, what's the uh, what they use for flattening? Information about the CCD they use, like basically everything you need, and a lots of extra stuff that you absolutely don't need. So long story short, that's the formula to calculate the um, pixel scale on the picture. So four point. 95 times 10 to the power of negative 6 times distance. Distance being the distance between the spacecraft and uh, the target, which is Pluto or Charon in our case. So then you can uh, use my preferred software, Autopano. Actually, it's called Autopano Pro. So funny fact, the uh, algorithm that's used to uh, build those mosaics and find basically structures in the, in the pictures and then link them together between, uh, between pictures. So that's called the SIFT algorithm. And that was invented and developed in Canada. So hey. And actually it's in the West, University of Calgary, I think. Um, so there's, um, so the version I, I, I use is, uh, you have to, to, to pay for it. It's not that expensive, but you still need to pay for it. There's um, a free version. So that's not open, open source, but it's, it's free. And it's, uh, if you uh, do a Google search, we'll uh, find it in uh, five minutes. So it has limited functionalities. Um, the other funny fact is um, a nice amount of companies tried to uh, commercialize the, uh, the concept and the, uh, the algorithm, and only one was really successful, and that's a French company, and their headquarter um, is uh, something like 30 minutes drive from my grandmother in, the, in the, the French Alps. So that's a funny thing. And that's used by people who want to do uh, large panoramas. That's also useful for the big um, panoramas from, from the Mars rover on, uh, on Mars. And uh, if you want to take like multiple pictures to have like high resolution, um, uh, high resolution picture of uh, your house, for example, that's what you want to use. And it's extremely easy, like uh, eight, 10 years old um, kid can, uh, can just select all the um, uh, subframes, click one button, it will do everything uh, f for you and you will end up with uh, a mosaic like that. So if you're not sure about the um, subframes that you need to include, 
that's perfect, perfectly fine as well. You can uh, basically dump like uh, 50 uh, subframes, and the algorithm will find out if those uh, subframes can can make uh, a mosaic for you. And it takes it's super fast, only uh, seconds. What takes time is the the final uh, rendering phase. Oh, I'm stuck. No, so that's the final result, because after you. Um, you do the mosaic, uh, you always want to do some additional post-processing. So I use PixInsight for almost uh, everything, so you can get uh, a quite crisp uh, picture. So that's uh, Pluto. I told you that's quite bigger than just a dot, and I can see uh, structures. <laughs> so now the fun starts. So we can measure structures on uh, Pluto. So let, let's start with something that's super easy, the diameter. Right, so I use one specific function of um, PixInsight called uh, dynamic uh, crop. So basically, I just do a crop and I see my, my box, and I can basically make sure that uh, I'm at the edge of the of the planet. Then I can rotate it so and average the uh, measurement I've uh, I've done. So there's one one trick though. Remember the 58,000 kilometers per hour, right? So the the spacecraft was moving like super fast towards Pluto which means the distance that we need to input in the formula changed, and actually quite dramatically. So to make that mosaic, and I, I checked, I was not able to find other subframes. So the, the uh, first one uh, was taken uh, when the space spacecraft was at 177,000 kilometers from Pluto, and the last one only 165,000 uh, uh, 165, kilometers from the target. So I mean, okay. Let's just do an average between those two values and uh, 171,000. Uh, okay, fine. I input the, uh, this value in the formula and come up with, oh, 2,378 kilometers. So let's ask our friend Google. So Pluto diameter, 2,377. Wow, that was pretty cool. Uh, uh, actually, this one, um, Kids at my son's school, they did it, and they found like the same same value. So it's extremely so, and that's the the fun with students. So grade six, they did the uh, mosaics of like everything Pluto, Corona, and, and and again, it, it's extremely easy. Then they did the post processing using uh, PixInsight uh, as well to expose structures. So they, they had lots of fun. And um, so grade twelve, uh, we did mosaics and measurements. So we, we, we measured like almost like everything we could find on on the surface of a Pluto or, or Charon, like uh, size of craters, like stuff that you can see uh, on the um, on the surface, like almost anything that oh, what's that stuff? Let's measure it. So lots of fun, and uh, just to give you an idea, the activity was done like within one hour. So it it's pretty. Uh, Pretty cool. So now, what's uh, what's going to happen? So in the in the video, they said if everything is fine and successful, then we may extend the mission. So yes, everything was successful. Um, papar paparazzi pictures taken, and uh, New Horizons went back to uh, hibernation. And I checked last night. Um, it was. Uh, 41.34 um, astronomical units away from uh, from us, which is quite far, and uh, it's uh, well, it's one point something um, astronomical units from its next target, which is called uh, 2014 MU69. So that's uh, another object, and uh, and. Actually, another fun fact is um, in order to find targets uh, in the Kuiper Belt, scientists use the Hubble Space Telescope to do like accurate measurements of um, of um, basically where the object is, and then multi with multiple measurements you can reconstruct the orbit, and with occultation you can even access the shape of the um, of the uh, object that you want to visit. And this one, uh, Mu69, is uh, so if I remember well, it looks like a bit like the um, uh, comet that the uh, Rosetta spacecraft, spacecraft visited. Like in a sense, it's, it sounds like two things that 
collided and got stuck together. And uh, it's quite, quite big, so, I mean, let's wait for the next, uh, when it wakes up, and when we'll get another set of, uh, of pictures that, that we can play with. And uh, that's it. So do you have any questions? to know um, how many objects like Pluto do we know beyond Pluto, let's say, that circle the, the Sun? So how many exactly? I won't be able to tell you. I'll have to ask my friend uh, Google again. But what I know is the uh, Hubble Space Telescope did uh, a nice amount of measurements to, uh, in order to get the next um, uh, New Horizons uh, target. So there's, and anyway, in the Kuiper Belt, there's like many of them. The, uh, the um, the goal and the game was to find the uh, interesting one that New Horizons can, uh, can visit. But yeah, a lot. I know that's pretty inaccurate, but... <laughs>